Welcome to Connect, a program where we connect guests with each other and with you at home. Today's theme is the importance of storytelling in our community. I am Jenny D'Angelo, and with me, the marvelous Billy Harris and the marvelous Marilyn Patton. Marilyn, would you like to start and tell us how you got interested in storytelling. Sure. Well, back in the 70s, I had read um, in The New Yorker the, use, the part of The Uses of Enchantment by Bruno Bettelheim. And he was arguing in there that really raw folk tales and fairy tales were important for children because he was using them with his disturbed patients, the children. children. And he found that if they could listen to the stories, they would then kind of put their ills onto the story, like a father who would be as bad as the one in Hansel and Gretel, you know, that then, and the, or the stepmother in Hansel and Gretel, that then the child would sort of put them in there and feel as if there was some comfort that there were parents who were worse than theirs, and, and that the, you could end up uh, solving your problems and healing. And he found that that helped his kids, the, the clients, to heal themselves. So I got interested in stories, and then when Gretchen Goldstein, who was the station manager at KUSP radio station, um, said that she needed a children's show, I started one. And within a couple of weeks, I think, um, I um, met Billy Harris, and I had seen her in a play, Sweet Bird of Youth, where she, it was a two-person play. She was the amazing lead. And so, of course, it was basically fan to to star. And I went up to her and told her how wonderful she was. And then just throwing it out, I said, how would you like to, because I had all, I'd started with stories like um, the, the, you know, the Little Red Riding Hood and wolf stories, and then gone into the kind of ecological thing about wolves. And then I was, but I was kind of running out of ideas and I thought I needed uh, material that, that would be original and um, it would be so good if we had somebody who could do the stories. So there was Billy, and so I asked her if she could come and be on the show, and she said, Yes! <laughs> right away. Yes. yes. And so we started off with the Narnia stories, which I thought was a little bit of a, that was okay, that, you know, that's a faraway land and stuff. But eventually, um, why don't, well, Billy, why don't you talk about how we worked on th the content? Because we, I would suggest, I started off with a suggestion, but I think you came up with Wind in the Willows very soon after that, right? Well, Wind in the Willows is one of my favorite books of all time. And, well, the truth is that when Marilyn asked me to come and read, I said, yes, when do I start? And what shall I read? And, and well, what would you like to read? I'd like to read Wind in the Willows. OK, fine. And then, of course, it went from there to Harry Potter and everything else, anything. You put the words in front of me, and I'd be so happy to read them to you. So this was the beginning of a huge thing, because I was on the air with Billy for about over six years. And then when I left, Joanne King, who had, who had originally run a children's bookstore called Castle Cottage Corner, Castle Cottage Corner came in, and she um, took over, and she changed the name. So it be, went from being Saturday's Child to being uh, Castle Cottage Corner, which was fine. And then Susan Freeman, who had done the Celtic show, yeah. then she came in and uh, ran it for a long time. So I think it lasted what over 20. What call it? I think she kept it at Castle Cottage. Castle so, Cottage? So it stayed I, over it. So we had 20 years of Saturday morning stories on the show, and I mean on KUSP. So I think that was... And I really? was a loyal listener all those years. And to be sitting here now with you talking like this is really thrilling because it allows me to almost feel the energetic reach of the show over the whole peninsula, never mind where else. And we keep finding people who have listened way back when. And yes. it's really wonderful about that. Because we, uh, the only time we ever had audience interaction was in October where I would become Witch Riddle and I would ask the kids to send in, to call in to the station and give me their uh -huh. riddles. And I'm not going to tell the riddles because they were pretty bloody. But, <laughs> but, um, but I would then repeat them on the air. Yeah. And so that, but that was the, we didn't have much 
other. Oh, and also, we went out and taped kids doing things, too. But Billy was the big hit. But Billy I was, was the, thinking the, maybe the main we person. could give our new audience a little bit of a taste of how it is to be sublimely read to by you. <laughs> well, I did used to say, are you sitting comfortably? Good. Then I'll begin. And then I would read. And I have brought The Wind in the Willows with me. So I'll read a little bit of it. When uh, the water rat and the mole first meet. Hello, mole, said the water rat. Hello, rat, said the mole. Would you like to come over, inquired the rat presently. Oh, it's all very well to talk, said the mole rather pettishly, he being new to a river and riverside life and its ways. The rat said nothing but stooped and unfastened a rope and hauled on it and then lightly stepped into a little boat which the mole had not observed. It was painted blue outside and white inside and was just the size for two animals. And the mole's whole heart went out to it at once, even though he did not yet fully understand its uses. The rat sculled smartly across and made fast. Then he held up his forepaws as the mole stepped gingerly down. Lean on that, he said. Now then, step lively. And the mole, to his surprise and rapture, found himself actually seated in the stern of a real boat. This has been a wonderful day, said he, as the rat shoved off and took to the skulls again. Do you know, I've never been in a boat before in all my life. What? cried the rat, open-mouthed. Never been in a... You never... Well, I... What have you been doing then? Is it so nice as all that? asked the mole shyly, though he was quite prepared to believe it as he leant back in his seat and surveyed the cushions, the oars, the rowlocks, and all the fascinating fittings and felt the boat sway lightly under him. Nice! It's the only thing, said the water rat solemnly. I don't know how long you want me to go oh, on. We well, I'd be Thank happy you, if you spoke forever, but we're, we're going to all discuss. <laughs> discuss. <laughs> but that was what was so wonderful, was Billy would be reading part of Wind in the Willows, and then she would stop. And then the next Saturday, the kids could listen again and hear some more. Then the next Saturday, some more. So we kept going all of Alice in Wonderland. Yep. Yes. And um, and Harry and, Potter, of course. And Harry all Potter. of Harry Potter. The boxcar children, yes. Didn't you do a little of the box? Maybe not. No, okay. I did Swallows you, and Amazon. Oh, Swallows and yes, Amazon. Yes. Yes. And, oh, gosh, I can't remember all the things. It right. went on for years. Yes. I mean, it's... I started reading in 1976, and they couldn't stop me until 2005. So, so when, there's been a lot. When you walk around the community, I would imagine that if people know you, or maybe they don't know how you look, but as soon as they hear your voice, they come trailing over to you from wherever, and that it's, there's a way in which the story of you is continuing in a way. So, so Billy kept on. She moved to Palo Alto, but... You were teach you were reading the stories at Capitola Book Cafe when it existed, right? And now she's reading in the parks for kids in the from um, Capitola parks. Book yeah. from uh, Santa Cruz Bookshop. Yeah, That's wonderful Bookshop Santa, Santa Cruz. Cruz. So she keeps on doing it. Thank goodness. I can't shut up. <laughs> Don't. Don't. But I'll tell you that for my for me then uh, my son was born the same year that we. Um, did the start of the show, but then I found that he was waking up in the middle of the night crying, and of course I wasn't getting any sleep, and I didn't know what to do, and I thought he was having night fears. So I th 
so thinking back to this whole thing about storytelling, I thought what he needs to know is that this is in a book. So I would get books and I started reading to him before he went to bed. He was about two till three. And I would read to him and then I would shut the book and he stopped having the night fears because he knew it was those things that you imagine were in the book and you could shut the book mm -hmm. and they weren't real. Mm -hmm. So I think that really helped him a lot. Mm -hmm. And then um, he got hit by a truck and thrown 16 feet in the air and um, when he was seven. And so I just started reading to him mm -hmm. because he was home for a week from school. I read The Hobbit and then I just kept going. And by, before Christmas, this is soccer season, so he had just started soccer. Before Christmas, we had finished the entire Lord of the Rings. Mm. And so, so I feel like that was a really important thing. And then we kept reading. We read the, all the Narnia books. We read all of mm -hmm. um, the, I mean, we just read everything. And pretty soon we were doing Mark Twain. So we got Tom Sawyer. We got halfway through Huckleberry Finn. And he said, I think I'll do it myself from now on. But, <laughs> but he became a writer and has published a book and has published and has How had a film made. So I feel like that helped him see that the stories could help him, and he uses those to help other people, too. That's great, Marilyn. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So I, th I feel mm. like those stories can be a really therapeutic thing for people, too. Yes. Get the scary things there, but they're in the story. Yeah, they're not mm. my real life. Or my real life is better than <laughs> that. Yeah. Well, well, I come to stories in a, in a slightly different way, uh, more in the form of poetry, but what you're saying about healing um, allows me to say that one of the things that I do in the community is I lead uh, writing groups at Women Care, the superb, extraordinary facility that we have here in Santa Cruz for women on the cancer journey. And I have been doing that since 2009, almost every month for all those years. And what happens is, when the women come together, each person says a piece of her story, but then be, maybe because I'm a poet, I end up writing poems that incorporate all that they said without, you know, revealing anything that one can't, but, and so maybe I could read yeah, one of those. Yeah, why don't you please read us oh, one? Oh, yes. Well, these are all. They're all, it's, the women inspire me so much, but maybe I'll read this one. Um, so this is after reading, I read to them James, Wright, James Wright's wonderful poem, A Blessing. And so that was my prompt. And then uh, we all write for a certain number of minutes. So that's why the title is After Reading A Blessing at Women Care. And I'll say it to you. You are the blessings in my life. You here sitting so quiet and earnest, so kind and honest. You are my kindred spirits and my friends of heart. The traffic rolls on outside, but here on our couches against the orange pillows framed by sunflowers and peacock feathers and the images of roses, we are content as we find our pockets of peace. As we wend our way through memories and recollections, dreams and stories of fists, wallets found on the theater floor, Yes, there is another week to be in awe through. There are appointments and meetings and moments or hours in the garden. All these may be coming up. But we give ourselves this time and the blessings reach out to unfold us again, to give us back more than what we have spoken or written. Again, the companionable silence. Again, the sense of comrades. Again, the blessings and the hope. Pack those up with your pencils and your notebooks in between the pages and scraps of memory and steps of the dance. So in the week that will be, 
Let your own nobility of being stay with you. Let our words of truth and depth tumble out as you sort through recipes or pictures on your desk. Let this small, quiet ecstasy go with you, remembering all the many blessings of this day. Wonderful. That's beautiful. These women inspire me so much, and their stories, what, I guess what, what, what's even more important is that when we come together for those two hours, the story of our greater life in a certain way comes out. And so they're not talking about their diagnosis or their treatment or their number four on this thing and number six on this thing. For the two hours that we are together sharing, they all say, I'm out of pain. It's a sort of a blessing that we all partake in. And then they carry that home with them out into their lives and all the people that they then meet. So again, the sort of the circle of story and the healing in the story goes out with the people as they go out into the week. It's a gorgeous thing. That's really <laughs> wonderful. It's, it's a good way to connect. That's why I, I like the, the, the title of this program because we're talking about connecting and there are so many ways to connect, mm -hmm. but connecting our words and our hearts with the truths of our lives. That's what we're, that's what we're doing. Well, that's, that's amazing. Another thing that you made me think about um, is that we, in, in the whole world, in the whole country right now and in the world, I feel like we're living in a very disenchanted world. And so when I was thinking about that title from Bettelheim, The Uses mm. of Enchantment, mm. is that you get these moments of enchantment and they can tell you that there's a better way to be. And that's kind of why, um, yeah, I've just been teaching Shakespeare and over the hill. And, and I mean, he just thought, I think, that he could in a world that really wasn't a very good world either, that he could have some moments of enchantment on the plays for the people. But I think it was even deeper than that. When he was writing all those eight plays about the Henriads, the two Henriads, he really thought, I'm going to, sh and, I, and I kind of want that for us. He wanted to show that there were, who, who the P English people were as, as a people, and to show by, by having them participate in the plays and go to the plays, that they could see who they were and therefore have more unity as a people. And I think that's what we mm -hmm. need now. Mm -hmm. But I think that there is somebody who's, well, at least one person who's doing that. And, and there's a number of ways, and you can think about it too. But when I went to see Hamilton, I thought, um, and I saw it way back when it was cheap, by the way, um, <laughs> is that he was, that that says in there that telling the story is, and telling the story in a new way is a way to make us re-understand what America means and, and uh, to think of in new ways about us. So, for example, the fact that all the people are people, immigrants and people of color, helped you to reimagine who we are as the United States. Mm -hmm. And he even had those lines that were, um, he said, um, and I'm not going to sing it. Okay, I may not live to see our glory, but will gladly join the fight. And when our children tell our story, they'll tell the story of tonight. Mm -hmm. Let's have another round tonight. Raise a glass to freedom, something they can never take away. No matter what they tell you, raise a glass to the four of us. Tomorrow there'll be more of us telling the story of tonight. So I mm -hmm. think that idea of telling mm -hmm. a story mm -hmm. that's a better story than the mm -hmm. one that we're living in. That, that And we can empower yeah, ourselves and right. each other by telling of the true story of yes. our lives and not the... And not a kind of whitewashed one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have to say that I feel as though I'm quite in the wrong place because you guys are all noble and I'm just reading. But you read people's words in such precision and your, your transmission is so powerful yeah. that everybody, even people who don't like to hear stories, Sit, sit when yeah. you read. And you know Billy has come to my classes and acted the 
the role oh. uh, for for um, the importance of being earnest. Oh, good. And so she'll so she'll come in and be the great star yes. actor, and the other students will come and do that. So she's just she's a born actor, and I think you've been acting since you were about two years old. Four. Right? Four. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> so but the other thing is that uh, for the last few years she was reading um, books for the bl for blind people, right? Oh. Nice. Oh, yeah. And, yes, I, and uh, see, talk about Noble. Mm. Yeah. Well, this was really great. It, it's, there's a company called Reading for the Blind and Dyslexic. Yes. And uh, it's great because you can record it and it goes all over the place to the. Oh, read, it, it's a, the company is called Learning Ally. Mm. And so I got a sort of education reading stuff that I would never read. But I got to read it for this recording that went out to different schools of... And that was really... That's about the best that's, thing I've ever I done. I think you've done noble things all the way along. Have I really? Yes. Oh, good. Yes. And then she also acted in Shakespeare, in Santa Cruz Shakespeare, but went back when it was Shakespeare Santa Cruz. Right, so as right. uh, queen... Tell us, which queens? Uh, no, I wasn't a queen. queen. I was the Duchess, Duchess. of York. Oh, okay. The Duchess of York in uh, Richard II and the Duchess of York in Richard III. But there aren't any more Duchesses of York, so I didn't get any more parts. <laughs> so, um, go ahead. Okay, so I feel like that's one of the things that we need is to have these stories that help us know who we are. And one of those, I think, in fact, is Harry Potter. You know that the kids nowadays, they all, if they if they all know Harry Potter, then they refer to it, talk about it, and it kind of gives them some sort of community. This back like Star Wars did 20 years ago. So my grandson totally, I mean, he got glasses, and he thought that was fine because mm -hmm. now he's Potter. now he looks like Harry Potter. I told him I could do a scar if he wanted, but <laughs> he didn't do that. But um, and then. I don't know if you remember that line from Love Actually. Do you remember that? It was I, I wrote it down here because I thought, we may be a small country, but we're a great one too. The country of Shakespeare, Churchill, okay. the Beatles, Sean Connery, Harry Potter, and David Beckham's wow. right foot. Well, anyway, but I just wow. thought those stories yeah. tell us, you know, really important yeah. things. So I noticed that we had a control room here, and it reminded me of the story, the plays of August Wilson, who's he decided to do a play for every decade of the tw of the 20th century and so he, and one of them has a control room in it where the white people are up in the control room and the African American entertainers are down mm -hmm. below but it really t told the story of that period the story mm -hmm. of Ma Rainey's Black Bottom and I think the other other people are doing different kinds of ways of telling stories and um, helping us to to get new new versions of who we are well maybe I can catch up a little of this together as we sort of start winding down because if you'll allow me I have another uh, piece that I did write at Women Care but it's still about this we all have stories inside us we carry them in all our secret places they are at our fingertips those small grooves that began to form when we were only six months in the womb they are surely in our eyes, those clear windows into the soul that have so many secrets. Our stories are in the way we walk. They are in the sway of our hips and the thrust of our feet. The steps we take look a lot like the ones our mothers took, yet we go farther. And I think we live our stories out by the friends we cherish the babies we hold, the skies we appreciate. We remember the stories that we read or that we were read to, and then we imagine ourselves inside them. Pippi Longstocking sails herself around the neighborhood with her trusty friends and a knapsack of food. The little prince on his little star, cherishing his one flower so true. I don't know what stories will roll out from our conversation, but from this mind and this heart, I say I am true to the listening, catching the small words as they tumble and land here between us. Thank you, Jenny. Beautiful. 
I, I love, love you. It. The little prints in there. Yes, I love it. The stuff. little yes. prints. Yes. yes. So I, I, we have a few more minutes. I, I want to encourage our whole audience to, um, well, look us up on Google and find us. I have books that are available. Billy is reading in the park. Marilyn is doing wonderful things. And all this, this, this show is because of wonderful, wonderful community TV. And so we want you, we encourage you all to tune in, watch us and other wonderful people speaking about how, how community comes together. Connect. How, how community connects. And Why how, don't you just mention about uh, you and Harry Potter? Why don't you tell that story? For well, a the very the reason I was so happy to be sitting with Billy is because I listened every Saturday, and then especially when she was reading Harry Potter, and then I missed an episode, and I called her up, and she let me come to her living room and be read to. What could be more wonderful than connecting that way over a story? So well, I thank you. I thank you. My I thank pleasure. You all. Anybody who wants to come and let me read to them anytime, anywhere, <gasps> and I'm available. Isn't that fabulous? Thank you, Connect TV, for making this possible. You have been watching Connect. Thank you, Billy and Marilyn, for sharing your experiences with storytelling in the community. I am Jenny D'Angelo. Please watch for the next program of Connect on community television here in fabulous Santa Cruz. Thank you so much.